Chapter 9 of the Moors in Spain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. The Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 9 The Prime Minister. Abdel Rahman III was the last great sultan of Cordoba of the family of the Omeyyad. His son, Hakam II, was a bookworm, and although bookworms are very useful in their proper place, they seldom make great rulers. A king cannot be too highly educated. He may know everything under the sun, and like several of the Cordovan sultans, he may employ his leisure in music and poetry, but he must not bury himself in his library or care more for manuscripts than for campaigns or prefer choice book binding to binding up the sore places of his subjects yet this was what hakam did he was not a weak man or at all regardless of his great responsibilities but he was too much absorbed in his studies to care about the glories of war and his other delight which consisted in building, was so far akin to his studious nature that it involved artistic tastes which are often allied to those of literature. Hakam's peaceful, studious temperament did no great harm to the state. He was son enough of the great caliph to lead his armies against the Christians of Leon when they did not carry out their treaties, and so overwhelming was the awe that his father had inspired so universal the sentiment of his crushing power that the christian princes of north submitted to hakam's interference with their affairs and one of them even came to cordova and with many abject genuflections implored the aid of sultan to restore him to his throne peace was soon signed between all the parties and hakam had leisure to collect his famous library. He sent agents to all parts of the East to buy rare manuscripts and bring them back to Cordova. His representatives were constantly searching the bookseller's shop at Cairo and Damascus and Baghdad for rare volumes for the Sultan's library. When the book was not to be bought at any price, he would have it copied, and sometimes he would even hear of a book which was only in the author's brain, and would send him a handsome present, and begged him to send the first copy to Cordova. By such means, he gathered together no fewer than 400,000 books, and this at a time when printing was unknown, and every copy had to be painfully transcribed in the fine clear hands of the professional copyist. Not only did he possess all these volumes, but unlike many collectors, he is said to have read them all, and even to have annotated them. So learned was he that his marginal notes were greatly prized by scholars after times, and the destruction of a great part of his library by the Berbers was a serious loss to Arab literature. It was possible for one successor of great caliph to rest upon his father's laurels, and enjoy his studious tranquillity while the enemy without was watching for an opportunity of renewing his attacks but two such sovereigns would undo the great work which abderrahman had accomplished and bring the cordovan empire tumbling down to the ground again hakam the second only reigned fourteen years and his son hisham the second was a boy of twelve when he ascended the throne what the young sultan might have been, had he been allowed fair play, no one can say, but it is recorded that he exhibited many signs of intelligence and sound judgments in his childhood, and showed some promises of following in the brilliant steps of his grandfather. Hakam's easy-going scholar's rule had, however, deprived his son and successor of any chance of real power while the student sultan was anxiously collating a manuscript or giving directions to a copyist or bookbinder 
the great officers of the state were gradually attaining a degree of authority which Abderrahman III would have instantly checked. The ladies of the Sultan's harem also began to exercise an influence upon the government of the country. Abderrahman built a city to please his wife but he would have been very much astonished if Ezra had ventured to dictate to him who was to be the prefect of police. When Hakam died, however, the harim influence was very strong, and the Sultana Aurora, mother of the young Caliph Hisham, was perhaps the most important person in the state. There was one, however, a favorite of hers, who was destined soon to become even more influential. This was a young man called Ibn Abi Amir, or the son of the father of Amir, but whom, since this is rather a roundabout name, we shall call by the title he afterwards adopted when he had won many victories over the Christians, Al-Mansur, which means the victorious by the grace of God. Al-Mansur started in life as an insignificant student at the University of Cordoba, where his father was known as a learned lawyer of good but not influential family. The young man, however, had no intention of restricting his ambitions to the modest elevation which his father had attained. While still a student, he dreamed of power and confidently predicted that one day he would be master of Andalusia. He even asked his schoolfellows, for they were little more than boys, what post they would prefer to have when he came to power, and it is worth noticing that when that event came to pass, he did not forget his promises. His career is an interesting example of what pluck, talent, and selfishness could do in a Muslim state, where the road to power was open to genius, however unpromising the beginnings. Al-Mansur, who was at first merely a professional letter-writer to the court servants, ingratiated himself with the Grand Chamberlain, who exercised the functions which would nowadays be held by a prime minister, and in due course he was appointed to some small offices about the court. Here his charm of manner and skillful flatteries gained him the favor of the ladies of royal harem, and especially of Aurora, who fell in love with the brilliant young man. Step by step, by dint of paying his court to princesses and making them magnificent presents for which he had sometimes to draw upon public funds, he rose to higher offices and by the age of 31 he enjoyed a comfortable plurality of posts, including that of a superintendent of the property of the heir apparent, a judgeship or two, and the office of commander of a division of the city guard. Everybody was charmed with his courtesy, his prodigal generosity, and the kindness with which he helped the unfortunate. He had already succeeded in attaching to himself a large number of persons, some of whom were of very high rank, when the death of Caliph Hakam placed Aurora in a position of great importance as a mother of the boy Caliph and gave Almansor the opportunity he needed of making his power felt. The two worked together, and after establishing the child Hisham on the throne, which was only effected by the murder of a rival claimant, he quickly suppressed the conspiracy of the palace Slavs, who would have nothing to say to the accession of Hisham. The head of government was Mus Hafi, the chamberlain, who had helped Almansur to climb the first rung of the ladder of power, and his junior readily joined him in his policy. The repression of the Slavs, many of whom were now banished, made the two officers very popular with the people of Cordoba, who cordially hated the foreign mercenaries. But this alliance was only for time. As soon as he saw his way to get rid of the chamberlain, Almansor was determined to do so without scruple. The first thing, however, was to increase his own popularity. An occasion immediately happened, which the young official boldly seized. The Christians were again becoming overweening on the northern marshes, and the chamberlain Mushafi 
being no soldier, did not know how to cope with their aggressions. Almanzor, who had been a judge and an inspector, was no more a soldier than the chamberlain, but he came of a sound old stock, and his ancestor had been one of the few Arabs who had accompanied Tariq and his Berbers in the first invasion of Spain. Without a moment's hesitation or self-distrust, he volunteered to lead the army against the Christians, and so successful was the raid he made upon Leon, and so liberal was his largest to the soldiery, that he returned to Cordova, not only triumphant, a civilian general, but also the idol of the army. A second campaign was undertaken against the Christians of the north, in which the generalship was really done by Galif, the commander of the frontier forces, a brave officer whom Almansor adroitly made his friend. Galif protested so warmly that the victories were the fruits of the young civilian's talents, and vaunted his sagacity so highly that the court and people came to believe that there lay a military genius under the cloak of the ex-lawyer, as indeed there was. Strengthened by this series of successes and by Galif's support, Almansor next ousted the son of the chamberlain from the post of prefect of Cordova and took his place, and so admirably did he exert his authority that never had the city been so orderly or the law so justly administered. Even his own son was beaten till he died because he had transgressed. His father, like Junius Brutus, allowed no exceptions in the execution of the law. By this policy, he added to his laurels. He had already won over the army and pleased the populace, and now he had won the favor of all law-abiding citizens. The time had come for a great stroke of diplomacy. He played the chamberlain off against the Galif so skillfully that he widened the bridge that already existed between the scarred men of arms and the noblest clerk who held the functions of prime minister, and by inducing the former to throw over an engagement he was making with the chamberlain for an alliance between their families and to give his daughter to Almansor instead, he gave the last blow to the old minister. In 978, only two years after the death of Hakam, Almansor had played his card so ably that he was in a position to accuse Mus Hafi of peculation, not without ample reason, and have him arrested, tried, and condemned. For five years, the once powerful chamberlain led a wretched life at the hills of Almansor, and then he died in prison poisoned probably by his conqueror, in a state of utter destitution, covered only by an old tattered cloak of the jailer. Such was the fate of all who came between Almansor and his ambition. The chamberlain, from the summit of glory and power, when thousands would come on bended knee to beg his favor, and when even an ex-king of Leon had sought humbly to kiss his hand, had been reduced to want and degradation by a young upstart whose insignificant origin had not crushed his genius. That same day on which the chamberlain was disgraced, Almansor stepped into his place. He was now at the height of power and enjoyed the position of virtual ruler of all Mohammedan Spain. The government of Andalusia consisted of caliph in the council, but Almansor had buried the caliph in his seraglio, and as for the council of viziers who should advise him concerning affairs of state, Almansor virtually united it in his own person. From his palace in the suburbs, he ruled the whole kingdom. Letters and proclamations were issued in his name. He was prayed for from the pulpits and commemorated on the coinage and he even wore robes of gold tissue woven with his name, such as kings only were wont to wear. He was not, however, safe from the attacks of his enemies. Ambition brings its own danger, and those who have been trampled upon are apt to turn and avenge themselves. 
Such was the case with Almanzor. One of the Slavs, whom he had summarily deposed when they were planning a change in succession, made an attempt to assassinate him, but it failed, and its author, along with the number of influential persons who had abetted the conspiracy, was arrested, condemned, and crucified. In Cordova, Almanzor was now supreme, for the young caliph showed no symptoms of rebelling against the tutelage to which he was subjected, and the queen of Harim, Aurora, was still the great minister's friend. One man only could pretend to any sort of equality with Almanzor, and this was Caliph, his father-in-law. The army admired Almanzor and wondered at his daring in taking the command of campaigns against the Christians without military experience, but they loved and adored Galif as a type of true warrior, bred to arms, and unconquerable in personal prowess. Galif was therefore a formidable rival, and Galif must be removed. The prime minister set about this task with his usual quiet determination. Whatever he undertook, he carried out with the same immovable composure and iron will. A proof of his character was shown very strikingly one day, when he was seated with the council of viziers, who formed the cabinet of the Moorish government. They were discussing some public question, when a smell of burnt flesh rose in the chamber, and it was discovered that the minister's leg was being cauterized with lead-hot iron, while he was calmly debating the affairs of the state. Such a man would find little difficulty in disposing any obstacle, even General Galib. He laid his plans carefully, and they never failed. When his measures were a little too strong to be immediately approved by the people, he always had a plan ready for restoring the mob to occasions. Thus, when the revolt of several leading men had culminated in the attempted assassination already mentioned, he perceived that he had enemies among the theological and legal classes, and he lost no time in making his peace with them. Summoning a meeting of the chief doctrinal authorities, he asked them to make a list of those works on philosophy which they considered dangerous and heretical. The Muslims of Spain were famous for their rigid orthodoxy, and the philosophers received very harsh treatment from them. They soon decided upon what the Roman Catholic Church calls an index expurgatorius, or a list of condemned books, and Almanzor forthwith had the proscribed works publicly burnt. By this simple means, although really a man of broad views and perfectly tolerant of philosophical speculation, he succeeded in making himself the champion of orthodoxy. The theologians conspired no more against him. A man so fertile in expedience would not find much difficulty in getting rid of Galib. He first began a series of army reforms by which he reduced the influence of individual commanders and gained for himself the devotion which had previously been bestowed upon captains of divisions. This he accomplished by drawing his recruits from Africa and from among the Christians of the north, who were, of course, without any prejudice in favor of any particular Muslim leader, and soon became attached to Almanzor when they understood his liberality and were convinced by repeated proofs of his military genius. He was a stern commander, and had been known to cut a man's head off with the culprit's own sword, because the same weapon had been seen gleaming in the dressed ranks when it should have been in its scabbard. But while a martinet in matters of drill and discipline, he was a father to his soldiers so long as they fought well and maintained order. His influence was unbounded. Once when he sat in camp and saw his men in panic running in with the Christians at their heels, he threw himself from his throne, flung his helmet away, and sat down in the dust. The soldiers understood the despairing gesture of their general, and suddenly turning about, fell upon the Christians, routed them, and pursued them even into the streets of Leon. 
Moreover, no one could lead them to such vast stores of booty as the men who made more than fifty successful campaigns against the princes of the north. The army, thus formed of new levies, became devoted to their master, and Ghalib and his veterans of the frontier were speedily beaten. Ghalib himself died in an engagement. One other leader, Jaffa, the prince of Zab, threatened the peace of Almansor by his extreme popularity with the troops, and he was presently invited to the minister's hall, made very drunk, and assassinated on his way home. This was by no means a solitary instance of Almansor's treachery and blood guiltiness. Such acts deprived him of the title of hero to which his many brilliant qualities almost attain, and it is impossible to like him. Yet, with all his sternness and unscrupulousness, Almansor brought Andalusia to a pitch of glory such as even the great caliph Abderrahman III had hardly contemplated. While keeping such hostile factions as remained in Cordoba tranquil and powerless, whilst conciliating the people by making splendid additions to the great mosque of Cordoba, when he found that they were beginning to grow indignant at the seclusion in which their young caliph was kept, and were listening to the insinuations of Aurora and the palace party, who had grown tired or jealous of Almansol, whilst overawing the caliph himself by his personal influence, whilst keeping a watchful eye that nothing escaped upon every department of the administration, and devoting no little time to the cultivation of literature and poetry, amid all these various employments, this indefatigable man waged triumphant war in Africa, and spread the dominion of the caliph along the Barbary coast, and twice a year, in spring and autumn, led his troops as a matter of course against the Christians of Leon and Castile. Like a man of culture, he took his books along his sword. His books were the poets who always accompanied his campaigns. Never was a general so constantly victorious, supported by his hardy foreigners, and also by many Christians who were attracted by his pay and the sure prospect of booty, he carried fire and sword through the land of the north. He captured Leon and raised its massive walls and towers to the ground. He seized Barcelona, and worst of all, he even ventured into the passes of Galicia and leveled to the ground the splendid church of Santiago de Compostela, which was the focus of countless pilgrimages and almost formed the Kaaba of Europe. The shrine of St. James, however, where numerous miracles attested the presence of the saint's relics, was spared. It is said that when the conqueror entered the deserted city, he found, of all its inhabitants, but a solitary monk who still prayed before the holy shrine. What doest thou here? demanded Almansor. I am at my prayers, replied the old monk. His life was immediately spared, and a guard was set round the tomb to protect him and it from the violence of the soldiery, who proceeded to destroy everything else in the city. Almansor well deserved his title of victorious, which was assumed after one of these campaigns. So long as his armies made their half-yearly expeditions, the Christian princes were paralyzed and Leon and the neighboring country became a mere tributary province of the kingdom of Cordoba. Castile, Barcelona, and Navarre were repeatedly defeated. He had taken the very capitals, Leon, Pamplona, Barcelona, and even Santiago de Compostela. Once he had brought the king of Navarre to his knees, simply because the uncompromising minister learned that there remained one captive Muslim woman in his kingdom. She was instantly delivered up, and many apologies were tendered for the inadvertence. Another time, Almansor found himself and his army cut off by the Christians, who had occupied an impregnable position in his rear, and barred his return to Cordoba. Nothing daunted, 
he ordered his troops to foray the country round about and collect materials for sheds and implements for husbandry. Soon the Christians, who dared not attack, but believed they held Moslems in their grasp, perceived them deliberately setting up barracks and contentedly tilling the soil and preparing for the various operations of agriculture. Their astonished inquiries were answered by the cool reply. We do not think it worth while to go home, as the next campaign will begin almost immediately. So we are making ourselves comfortable for the interval. Filled with consternation at the prospect of permanent Muslim occupation, the Christians not only abandoned their strong position and allowed the enemy to go scot-free, laden with booty, but even supplied them with baggage mules to carry off the spoils. Al-Mansur, however, though invincible by men, was not proof against death. After a last victorious campaign against Castile, he was seized with mortal illness and died at Medinaceli. The relief of the Christians is expressed in the simple comments of the monkish analyst. In 1002 died Al-Mansur and was buried in hell. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of the Moors in Spain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. The Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 10. The Berbers in Power. The best constituted countries will occasionally fall into anarchy when the will that has guided them is removed, and this is one of the strong arguments of those who hold that a state is best governed by the mass of its people. Keep a people in leading strings, it is said, and the moment the strings break or are worn out, the people will not know where to go. The theory, however, is only a general statement of an obvious truth, and its application depends greatly upon the character of the people. Some nations seem always to need leading strings, and none has yet become absolutely independent of the guidance of a dominant mind, nor would such independence be desirable unless a dead level of mediocrity be our ideal of a state. Andalusia, at all events, could not dispense with her leaders, and the instant her leader died, down fell the state. When great Caesar fell, then I and you and all of us fell down, not so much for sympathy as in capacity. The multiplicity of mutually hostile parties and factions made anything resembling a settled constitution impossible in the dominion of the Moors. Only a strong hand could restrain the animosity of the opposing creeds and races in Andalusia, and those who have considered the character and history of Ireland and the irreconcilable enmity which prevails between the north and south in that island of factions, will allow that the Arabs were not the only people who found mixed races and religions impossible to govern with the smoothness of a homogeneous nation. The history of Andalusia, so far as we have told it, has been a series of ups and downs. First we saw a magnificent raid led by born soldiers, ending in an unexpected conquest. Hardly was the peninsula won when the jealousies and divisions of the various elements that made up the invading host bade fair to destroy the harvest just reaped by the sword. Then the strong man, the born king, appeared in the person of the first Abderrahman, and Andalusia once more became outwardly one dominion. O oh, king, live forever, was the conventional form of address to the Persian monarch, and one is tempted to think that its realization might be the solution of all political troubles, provided the right king was chosen for immortality. The first king of Andalusia was naturally not immortal, 
and the consequence of his death was what always happens when a strong repressing force is withdrawn, the people fell again into civil war and anarchy. Yet again, the God-gifted king came to rescue the nation. The great caliph imposed law and order throughout his dominions, beat back the invader, and trod the rebel on the foot. For fifty years, Andalusia was a paradise of peace and prosperity. Had the third Abderrahman been immortal, she might have been peaceful to this day, and we should never have heard of the persecutions of Jews and Moors, of the terrible work of the Inquisition, or even, to come to very small things, the Carlists. It is a pity that such dreams cannot be true. But the great caliph had not left the country unprovided with a leader. A king had saved Spain twice, and now it was a prime minister who held the state together. Almanzor, the unconquerable minister, was able to make his masterful will felt to every corner of the peninsula, but Almanzor, too, was mortal, and when he died, and, as the monk piously hoped, was buried in hell, the land which owed him her prosperity and wealth, her perfect orderliness and security, became a prey to all the hostile forces which only his iron hand could repress. For eighty years, Andalusia was torn to pieces by jealous chiefs, aggressive and quarrelsome tyrants, Moors, Arabs, Slavs, and Spaniards, and though many of the old roots of dissension had been plucked up by time, and the jealousies that arose from memories of tribal glories were sometimes forgotten because men had lost their pedigrees, there were enough rivalries personal, racial, and religious, to make Andalusia as much a hell upon earth as even the monkish chronicler could have desired for a burial place for Almansor. For six years after the prime minister's death, his son Musafa maintained the unity of the kingdom. Then followed the deluge of greedy adventurers, rival caliphs, and impudent pretenders. The Spaniard, who formed, after all, the bulk of population in which they were merged loved to be ruled by a king. They liked a dynasty and were proud of the memories of the great Omayyad house. The rule of minister, however just and good, was not their idea of government. The king must rule by himself. So they rebelled against the authority of a second son of Almansor, who had provoked them by publicly putting in his claim to succeed to the throne and they insisted on the caliph taking the reins of state into his own weak hands. The unfortunate Hisham, thus suddenly dragged out of the seclusion of his harem, where he had been a happy prisoner for thirty years, in vain implored the people not to demand the impossibilities of him. They would have him rule, and when it became clear to everybody that the feeble middle-aged man was as helpless as an infant, they made him abdicate and set up another member of his family in his place. This was really the end of the Omayyad dynasty of Andalusia. Caliph after caliph was set up for the next twenty years. One was the puppet of the Cordovans, another was the puppet of the Slav god, a third was the puppet of the Berbers, a fourth was a sort of figurehead to mask the ambition of the ruler of Seville but all were puppets of some faction, and had no vestige of real authority. The throne room in the palace became the scene of murder after murder, as caliph succeed caliph. One poor wretch hid himself in the oven of bedroom, till he was discovered, dragged out, and butchered before the eyes of his successor, whose turn was not far off. Hisham the second, the poor creature who had been kept in a state of perpetual infancy by Almansor and the queen mother Aurora was forced to play his part in the rarity show. He was again set up and again pulled down, and the silken chains of his imprisonment among the beauties of his harem were exchanged for the gloomy walls of a real dungeon. What became of him afterwards is unknown. His women said that he had contrived to escape and had taken refuge in Asia 
or at Mecca. The throne possessed few attractions for the miserable caliph, who loved seclusion and pious duties, and he must have known that his presence in Andalusia gave a rallying cry to ambitious partisans and could only lead to further strife. It was natural that he should prefer to end his days in this exercise of devotion at the holy temple of Islam. An impostor, who closely resembled Hisham in person, set himself up as the caliph at Seville, and was acknowledged as a convenient puppet by the powerful lord of that city, but the real Hisham had disappeared forever, and no one heard of him again. How pitiful was the fate of the unhappy Omayyad, who allowed ferocious Moors or Slavs in turn to use them as pieces on their chessboard, may be seen from what happened at the deposition of the third Hisham. By order of the chief men of the city, this mild and humane prince was dragged with his family to a dismal vault attached to the great mosque of Cordoba. Here, in total darkness, half frozen with the cold and damp, and poisoned by the foul air of the place, the wretched caliph sat, holding his only child, a little girl, to his breast, while his wives hung round him in scanty clothing, weeping, shivering, and disheveled. They had been long without food, and their inhuman jailers had left them unnoticed for hours. The sheikhs then came to announce to Hisham the decision of the council which had been hastily summoned to debate upon his fate, but the poor caliph, who was trying to restore a little warmth to the child in his arms, interrupted them. Yes, yes, I will submit to their decision, whatever it is, but for God's sake, get me some bread. This poor child is dying of hunger. The sheikhs were touched. They had not designed such torments, and the bread was brought. Then they began again. Sire, they have determined that you shall be taken at daybreak to be imprisoned in such and such a fortress. So be it, answered the caliph. I have only one favor to ask. Permit us to have a lantern, for the darkness of this dismal place appalls us. The lord spiritual and temporal of the Mussulmans of Spain had fallen to such strait that he had to beg for bread and a candle. Such scenes as these were now frequent in Cordova. Each revolution brought its fresh crops of horrors. The people of Cordova, who had greatly increased in numbers, had also nourished those independent sentiments which the immense development of trade and manual industry and the consequent creation of a prosperous artisan class generally promote. And when they overturned Almanzor's dynasty, the mob broke out in the usual manner of mobs and wreaked their vengeance by pillaging the beautiful palace which the great minister had built in the neighborhood of the capital for the use of himself and the government officials. When they had ransacked the priceless treasures of the palace, they abandoned it to the flames. Massacres, plundering, and assassination went on unchecked for four days. Cordoba became a shambles. Then the Berbers had their turn. The imperious Slav god, who had won the cordial detestation of the people, were succeeded by the brutal Berbers who rioted in the plunder of the city. Wherever these barbarians went, slaughter, fire, and outrage followed. Palace after palace was ransacked and burnt, and the lovely city of Ezra, the delight of the great caliph, was captured by treachery, sacked, and set on fire, so that there remained of all the exquisite art that two caliphs had lavished upon its ornaments nothing but a heap of blackened stones. Its garrison was put to the sword, its inhabitants fled for refuge to the mosque. But the Berbers had neither scruples nor bowels, and men, women, and children were butchered in the sacred precincts. Ten, ten. While the capital was torn to pieces by savage bands of Slavs and Berbers, and was setting up one caliph after another, varying the family of Omayya with that of Hamoud, were trying the effect of governing town council the provinces had long thrown off all allegiance to the central state. 
Every city or district had its own independent lord. So soon had the consolidating effects of Almanzor's rule disappeared. The Spaniards themselves enjoyed little of this sudden accession of small powers. They had to look on and lament while foreigners divided their land among them. Berber generals fattened upon the south. The Slavs subdued the east. The rest fell to Pavanus or to the few noble families who had by some accidents survived the blows which Abderrahman III and Almansol had dealt at the aristocracy. Cordova and Seville, the two most important cities of Andalus, had set up republics in name, however, rather than fact, for the Muslim first consul was a very close likeness of the emperor. In the first half of the 11th century, some twenty independent dynasties came into power in as many towns or provinces, among which the Ebodite of Seville, the Hamut family at Malaga and Algeciras, the Zritites at Granada, the Beni Hood at Zaragoza, the Dunnun dynasty at Toledo, and rulers of Valencia, Murcia, and Almeria were the most important. Some of these dynasties were good rulers. Most of them were sanguinary tyrants, but, curiously, not the less polished gentlemen who delighted to do honor to learning and belles lettres and made their courts the homes of poets and musicians. Mortimid of Seville, for instance, was a prince of many accomplishments, yet he kept the garden of heads, cut off his enemy's shoulders, which he regarded with great pride and delight. As a whole, however, the country was a prey to disorder, as intolerable and as dangerous as that which prevailed when the great caliph came to the throne. It was not quite the same in character, for there was no great Christian rebellion like that of Ibn Hafsun, but the anarchy was as universal, and the danger of total collapse more imminent than ever. For the Christians of the north were now on the move. They saw their opportunity, and they made the most of it. Alfonso VI, who had united under his sway the three kingdoms of the Asturias, Leon and Castile, understood his part perfectly. He saw that he only had to allow the various Muslim princes rope enough, and they would proceed to hang themselves with the utmost expedition. These short-sighted tyrants, indeed, caring only for their petty individual power and eagerly aiding in anything that could weaken their rivals, threw themselves at the Alfonso's feet and implored his assistance whenever they found themselves overmastered by a more powerful neighbor. Partly in consequence of act of this kind, and partly in terror at the furious raids which the Castilian made throughout the country, even as far as the port of Cadiz, the Muslim states were almost all tributaries of the king of Castile, who took care to annually demand the heavier and more heavy tribute as the price of his friendship, in order to lay up stores for the great conquest which he had in mind. The North was poor, and with a fine irony, he trusted to the immense contributions of his vassals among the Andalusian princes to provide the sinews of the war which should destroy them. Divided and jealous as were the Mohammedan dynasties, there was a limit to their patience. When Alfonso had bathed in the ocean by Hercules pillars, rejoicing that at last he had trespassed all Spain and touched the waterly border when he had established a garrison of more than 12,000 daring men in the fortress of Aledo, in the very midst of the Muslim territories, whence they ruthlessly emerged to harry the whole country and commit every sort of savage outrage. When Rodrigo Diaz de Viva, my seat the challenger, had established himself in Valencia with his Castilians and lay waste the neighboring lands, when it became clear to everyone that Alfonso meant nothing less than the reconquest of all Spain and the extermination of all Muslims, then, at last, the Mohammedan princes awoke to their danger and began to take measures for their defense. 
helpless in themselves, and in spite of the common danger, despairing of any firm collected action among so many and such hostile factions, they took the only other course possible, they called in the aid of the foreigner. Some, indeed, foresaw dangers in such aid, but Motemid, the king of Seville, silenced them. Better be a camel driver in African desert, he said, than a swine herd in Castile. The power they required was not far off. A new Berber revolution had taken place in North Africa, and a sect of fanatics called the Marabouts or Saints, Almoravides, as the Spaniards named them, had conquered whole country from Algiers to Senegal. They were much the same sort of people as Tariq and his followers, and they were ready enough to cross the water and conquer the fertile provinces of Spain. They made it a favor, indeed, and evinced supreme indifference to the attractions of Andalusia, but they came, and it was easy to see that they meant to stay. When the Almoravides first came over, like a cloud of locusts, to devour the country, thus offered to their appetites, they found the way perfectly open. The mass of the people of Andalusia rejoiced to see once more a strong arm coming to repress the disorder which had destroyed their well-being ever since the death of great Almansor. The petty tyrants either had invited them or could not resist them, and were, at all events, glad to see the Castilians successfully repelled. The Almoravide king, Yusuf, the son of Teshvin, after appropriating Algeciras as a harbor and necessary basis of operations, marched unopposed through the provinces and met Alfonso at Zalaca, or as the Spaniard called it, Sacralias, near Badajoz, October 23, 1086. Alfonso, as he looked upon his own splendid army, exclaimed, with men like this, I would fight devils, angels, and ghosts. Nevertheless, he resorted to a ruse to score a surprise over the joint forces of Berbers and Andalusian, but Yusuf was not easily disconcerted. He took the Castilian army skillfully in front and rear, and thus placed between two fires. In spite of the obstinate resistance which the tried warriors of Castile knew well how to offer, he crushed them utterly. Alfonso barely escaped with some five hundred horsemen. Many thousands of the best sword arms in Castile lay stiff and nerveless on that fatal field. After the victory, Yusuf the Almoravide returned to Africa, leaving three thousand of his Berbers to help the Andalusians. He had promised to make no annexations, and except in retaining the harbor of Algeciras, he had so far kept his word. The Andalusians were delighted with him. They praised his valor and exulted over the savings of the land. They admired his simple piety, which let him do nothing without the advice of his priests, and which had induced him to abolish all taxes in Spain except those few authorized by the Caliph Omar in the earliest days of Islam. The upper classes, indeed, ridiculed his ignorance and rough manners. He could speak but little Arabic, and when the poets recited their charming verses in his honor, he generally missed the points of the compliments, no slight offense to the polished and elegant Andalusians, who never forgot their poetry, even when they were up to their knees in blood. Yusuf was to them a mere barbarian but their contempt for his education did not greatly matter. They could not do without his sword, and the vast mass of the people, thinking rather of comfort than culture, were ready to receive him joyfully as sovereign of Andalusia. In 1090, the king of Seville again prayed the Almoravide to come over and help him against the Christians, who were as bold as ever, and carried on a perpetual guerrilla warfare from their stronghold of Aledo. He acceded with assumed unwillingness, and this time he directed his attacks quite as much against the Andalusian princes as against the Christians of Castile. 
these foolish tyrants dinned into his ears innumerable complaints against each other and mutually betrayed themselves to such an extent that yusuf very soon had grounds for distrusting whole body of them he had on his side the people and above all the priests these soon absolved him from his promise not to annex andalusia and even went to so far as to urge him that it was his duty in god's name to restore peace and happiness to the distracted land always under the influence of his spiritual advisers and sufficiently prompted by his own ambition without any such external impetus yusuf readily fell in with this view and before the year ten ninety was out he had begun the subjugation of spain he entered granada in november and distributed its wonderful treasures its diamonds pearls rubies and other precious jewels its splendid ornaments of gold and silver its crystal cups and gorgeous carpets its unheard of riches of every sort among its officers who had never in their lives seen anything approaching such magnificence tarifa fell in december and the next year saw the capture of seville and many of the chief cities of andalusia an army sent by alfonso under the famous captain alva fanez was defeated and all the south lay at the feet of the almoravides save only valencia which no assault could carry so long as the seed lived to direct the defense in eleven o two after the hero's death valencia succumbed and now the whole of the mohammedan spain with the exception of toledo had become a province of the great african empire of the almoravides the mass of the people had reason to be satisfied for a time with the result of their appeal to the foreigner a minority consisting of all the men of position and of education were not so well pleased with the experiment the reign of the puritans had come and without a milton to soften its austerity the poets and men of letters who had thriven at the numerous little courts where the most bloodthirsty despot had always a hearty and appreciative welcome for a man of genius and would generally cap his verses with impromptu lines were disgusted with the savage burghers who could not understand their refinements and who when they sometimes attempted to form themselves upon the model of the cultivated tyrants who had preceded them made so poor an imitation that it was impossible to help laughing the freethinkers and men of broad views saw nothing very encouraging in the accession to power of the fanatical priest who formed the almoravides advisers and who were not only rapidly opposed to anything that savoured of philosophy but read their koran exclusively through the spectacles of a single commentator the jews and christians soon discovered what the tolerance of the almoravides was they were cruelly persecuted massacred or else transported the old noble families the few that remained and the remnants of the petty princes were in despair when they saw the stranger whom they had bidden to their aid taking up his permanent station in their dominions and recalled with terror the doings of similar hordes of Berbers in the latter days of the Cordovan Caliphate. But the mass of the people were glad enough to see the Almoravides staying in the land. Their lives and goods were at last safe, which had never been the case when the country was cut up into a number of separate principalities, few of which were strong enough to protect their subject outside the castle gates, and the roads were free from the brigands who had made the travelling impossible for many years and the christians instead of pouncing upon unsuspecting villages and harrying the lands were driven back to their own territory where a wholesome dread of the berbers and a long strife among themselves kept them at a safe distance order and tranquillity reigned for the moment the law was respected and the people once more dreamed of wealth and happiness the dream was a delusion there was no prosperity in store for the subject of almoravides what had happened to the romans and the goths 
now happened to the Berbers. They came to Spain, hardy, rough warriors, unused to ease or luxuries, delighting in feats of strength and prowess, filled with a fierce but simple zeal for their religion. They had not been long in the enjoyment of the fruits of their victory, when all the demoralization which the soft luxuries of Capua brought upon the soldiers of Hannibal came also upon them. They lost their martial habits, their love of deeds of daring, their pleasure in enduring hardships in the brave way of war. They lost all their manliness with inconceivable rapidity. In twenty years there was no Berber army that could be trusted to repel the attacks of the Castilians, in its place was a disorganized crowd of southern debauchees, miserable poltroons who had drunk and fooled away their manhood's vigor and become slaves to all the appetites that make men cowards. Instead of preserving order, they had now become the disturbers of order, brigands when they could pluck up courage to attack a peaceful traveler, thieves on all promising opportunities. The country was worse off than ever it had been, even under the petty tyrants. The enfeebled Berbers were at the back and call of bad women and ambitious priests, and they would count order one day what they commanded the day before. Such rulers do not rule for long. A great revolution was sapping the power of Almoravides in Africa, and the Castilian under Alfonso the Battler resumed their raids into Andalusia. In 1125, they harried the south for a whole year. In 1133, they burnt the very suburbs of Cordoba, Seville, and Carmona, and sacked Jerez and set it in a blaze. The Christian forays now extended from Leon to the Straits of Gibraltar, yet the besotted government did nothing to meet the danger. Exasperated at its feebleness, the people finally rose in their wrath and drove their important rulers from the land. At last, says the Arab historian, when the people of Andalus saw that the empire of the Almoravides was falling to pieces, they waited no longer, but casting away the mask of dissimulation, broke out into open rebellion. Every petty governor, chief, or man of influence, who could command a few followers and had a castle to retire to in case of need, styled himself sultan and assumed the other insignia of royalty, and Andalus had as many kings as there were towns in it. Even Hamdin rose at Cordoba, even Maimun at Cadiz, even Kazi and even Wazir Sedarai held the west. Ramtuni, Granada, even Mardanish, Valencia, some Andalusians, others Berbers, all, however, shortly disappeared before the banners of Abdel Mumin, who deprived every one of them of their dominions and subjected the whole of Andalus to his rule. Abdel Mumin was the leader of the Almohades, who succeeded to the Almoravide power in Africa and Spain. End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of the Moors in Spain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. The Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole. Chapter 11. My Seed, the Challenger. It is time to glance at the opponents of the Moors in the north. We have seen how Pelayo gathered together the remnants of the Goths in the inaccessible caves and fastnesses of the Astrian mountains, how this remnant soon advanced beyond its early boundaries, and taking courage from the indifference or the disunion of the Berber tribes who were quartered on the frontiers of the Mohammedan dominions, gradually recovered most of the territory north of the Sierra de Guadarrama, and there established the kingdom of Leon and the county of Castile, while the separate kingdom of Navarre arose further east beneath the Pyrenees. 
We have also seen how these Christian kingdoms were in a state of almost constant war with their Moorish neighbors and might have been seriously dangerous but for the no less constant divisions which neutralized the various Christian states. So long as the kingdom of Cordoba remained strong and undivided, while the Christians of Leon, Castile, and Navarre wasted their vigor in civil wars, the Moors were fully equal to the task of preserving their dominions. But when the kingdom of Cordoba fell and Andalusia became a prey to petty dynasties, each of which thought first of its own interest and then perhaps of the interest of the Mohammedan power at large. The Christians became more venturesome and were enabled to wring from the Moors a considerable accession of territory. During the confusion of the 11th century, when almost every city in Andalusia formed a state by itself, we have seen that the Christians scoured the land of Muslims with their victorious armies and exacted tribute from many of the most important Moorish princes. At this time, Fernando I had united the greater part of the north under his own scepter. He had combined the conflicting provinces of Leon and Castile and incorporated the Astrias and Galicia in his dominion. Fernando was undoubtedly the most powerful monarch in all Spain at this time. He had annexed Lormego, Viseo, Coimbra, and Portugal, and took tribute from the kings of Zaragoza, Toledo, Badajoz, and Seville, and though his imprudent division of his dominions among his three sons and two daughters involved the north in a series of civil wars after his death, Alfonso VI, the valiant, eventually succeeded in cementing the scattered fragments together again, and henceforward the progress of the Christian power in Spain was inevitable. It was only the immense bribes of the Mohammedan princes who paid blackmail to a fabulous amount to buy off Christians and the armies of the Almoravides in the background that prevented the entire reconquest of Andalusia by the Christians at this period of Moorish weakness. As it was, the Moors were in no sense their own masters. They were harassed between the dread of Alfonso and the scarcely less alarming supremacy of their Almoravide ally and in the end they had to succumb to the latter. At this time we find the Christians interfering most of the political affairs of the Mohammedan states. Christian armies overrunning their territories and demanding heavy tributes for their goodwill, and so complicated became the alliances between the two parties that many Christian mercenaries were to be found in the armies of the Moors, vigorously assisting in campaigns of devastation and sacrilege through Christian provinces, while Moors were ready to join the Castilians against their fellow Muslims. It was, in short, a time of adventurers, of paid mercenaries, of men who fought for personal interest and profit instead of for king and country. We should make a great mistake if we regarded the warriors of Leon and Castile as anything approaching an ideal of knightly honor and chivalry, and a still greater error would be to imagine them polished, cultivated gentlemen. The Christians of the north formed the most striking possible contrast to their Moorish rivals. The Arabs, rough tribesmen as they had been at their first arrival, had softened by contact with the Andalusians and by their own natural disposition to enjoyment and luxury into a highly civilized people, delighting in poetry and elegant literature, devoted to the pursuit of learning, and above all, determined to enjoy life to the utmost. Their intellectual tastes were unusually fine and delicate. They were moved by the emotions which could only be felt by men of taste and savoir vivre. They were romantic, imaginative, poetical, speculative, and would bestow on a well-turned epigram what would have sufficed to pay a regiment of soldiers. 
The most tyrannical and bloodthirsty among their despots was held in some contempt if he were not also something of a poet, or at least instinctively appreciative of polished wit and courtly eloquence. Music, oratory, as well as the severer pursuit of science, seemed to come naturally to this brilliant people, and they possessed in a high degree that quality of critical perception and delicate appreciation of the finer shades of expression which in the present day we associate with the French nation. The Christians of the North were as unlike this as can well be conceived. Though descended from an older kingdom, the northern states had most of the qualities of new nations. They were rude and uncultivated. Few of their princes possessed the elements of what could be called education, and they were too poor to indulge in the refined luxuries of the Moorish sovereigns. The Christians were simply rough warriors, as fond of fighting as even their Muslim antagonists, but even better prepared by their hard and necessarily self-denying lives for the endurance of long campaigns and the performance of desperate deed of valor. They had no idea of the high standard of chivalrous conduct which poets afterwards infused into their histories. They were men of the sword, and little besides. Their poverty made them any man's servants. They sold their valor to him who paid them best. They fought to get a livelihood. We have seen how the great minister Almanzor won his victories against Leon and took Santiago with the aid of a large contingent of the Leonese themselves, who perceived clearly enough on which side their fortunes were to be made. The history of the 11th century in Spain is full of such examples of the employment of Christian chevalier industry by Moorish princes, but of this none has ever attained such celebrity as the Cid, the national hero of Spain. The Cid's proper name was Rodrigo Diaz of Bivar, and he was called the Cid because that was the title which his Moorish followers naturally gave him. A Mohammedan gentleman is still addressed in Egypt and elsewhere by the title of Seed, which is a corruption of the word Sayyid, meaning master. The Seed or master was also styled Compeador, which signifies champion or more accurately challenger, because his exceeding prowess made him the natural challenger in those single combats which in Spanish wars commonly preceded a general engagement between two armies. A famous warrior would advance before the ranks as Goliath of Gaz stood forth before the armies of Israel and challenged the opposing forces to send him out a champion, and none was more renowned for his triumphs in this manner of warfare than Rodrigo Diaz, Mio Cid el Campeador as the old chronicler affectionately calls him. It is not easy to decide how much of the splendid history which had gathered round the exploits of the Cid is true. The Christian chroniclers stopped at nothing when they began to describe their national hero, and the enthusiasm that did not shrink from relating how the king of Leon seized Paris and conquered the French, Germans, Italians, and even the Persians can be trusted still less when it sounds the glories of the beloved Cid. The Spanish ballads surround their hero with the saintly aureole of all the virtues and forget that many of these virtues would not have been understood or appreciated by the Cid himself or his contemporaries in Castile. The Arabic writers are generally more trustworthy but their judgment can hardly have been unbiased when they spoke of a Christian who wrought such a misery to the Muslims of Valencia as did the famous Campeador. Yet even they call him a miracle of God. In this critical age, we are frequently obliged to abandon with regret the most charming traditions of our childhood's histories, and the seed has not been spared. A special book has been written by an eminent Orientalist to prove that the redoubtable challenger 
was by no means the hero he was supposed to be, that he was treacherous and cruel, a violator of altars, and a breaker of his own good faith. Professor Dozier maintains that the romantic history of the Cid is a tissue of inventions, and he has written on account of the real Cid to counteract these misleading narratives. He founds his criticism mainly on the Arabic historians, in whom, despite their national and religious bias, he places as blind a reliance as less learned people have placed in the chronicle of the Cid. Yet it is surprising how trifling are the differences that can be detected between his real Cid and that romantic chronicle of the Cid the substance of which was compiled by Alfonso the Learned only half a century after Cid's death, and which Robert Southey translated into English in 1805 with such skill and charm of style that his version has ever since been almost as much a classic as the original. Everyone can separate for himself the obviously legendary instance in the delightful old chronicle without any assistance from the Arabic historians who deal cheaply with one period alone of the Cid's career and the best popular account of the hero in discriminating hands and with due allowance is still Saudi's fascinating chronicle. The Cid of the chronicle is not at all the same as the Cid of the romances and while we cheerfully abandon the latter immaculate personage, we may still believe in the former. Of course, our Cid had his faults, and was guilty of not a few thoroughly indefensible acts. He was no very orthodox champion of the faith, for he fought as well for the Moors as for the Christians, and would as dispassionately rob a church as a mosque. But all this is clear enough to anyone who reads the chronicle, and it does not make the seed anything but what he always was, a hero of the rude days of yore. If we are to limit our definition of heroism to a characters that display all Christian virtues, long-suffering, gentleness, and pity, we shall have to dismiss most of our old friends. Achilles was not a very gentle or compassionate when he dragged the body of Hector round the walls of Troy, but Achilles is the hero of the Iliad. Nine out of the ten of the heroes of antiquity committed a host of acts which we moderns, with our superfine sensibilities, call cruel, ungenerous, even dastardly. It is a pure perversion of history to apply latter-day codes of morality to the heroes of bygone ages. Let us admit that they are not all cold, and then let us delight in their great deeds, the mighty swing of their sword arms, the crushing shock of their onset, their tall stature and flashing eyes as they ride to meet their foes. We do not expect them to be philosophers or strict advocates of the theories of political economy. We are quite satisfied with them as they are, heroes, brave, gallant leaders of men. The Cid was a real hero to the Spaniard, first because he fought so magnificently and that used once to be title enough to reverence, secondly because, like the mythical Bernardo del Carpio, and the real Fernando González, he was the champion of Castile, and had bearded the king of Leon, and thus represented the immemorial jealousy which the Castilians entertained for the powerful neighbors who absorbed their province. And thirdly, because the minstrels forgot his long alliance with the Moors, or contrived to give it a disinterested aspect, and remembered him only as the great champion of the Christian people against the infidels. But the very cause which specially commended him to the Castilians, his insubordination to King Alfonso, made him a less perfect hero to the writer of the Chronica General, from which the Chronicle of the Cid was extracted. That writer or compiler, Alfonso the Learned, King of Leon and Castile could not approve 
the haughty independence of the Cid toward his own forerunner, the sixth Alfonso. Hence, in the southeast version of the chronicle, which is enriched with many extracts from the poem of the Cid and other sources, we have a check upon the excessive adulation of the ballads and romances. There is no lack of details in the work which are anything but creditable to the seed, but nevertheless the true heroic character with all its faults and limitations is well sustained, and the record forms a wonderfully interesting picture of a stirring time and the greatest figure among the Spanish chevaliers. The story of the seed would fill a volume by itself. All we can attempt here is to extract a few of the most striking passages of the chronicle. The youth of the hero is to a large extent merged in myth. He first comes into historical documents in 1064, when, though scarcely more than twenty, he had already won his title of challenger by a triumphant single combat with a knight of Navarre, and was soon afterwards appointed commander-in-chief of the forces of Castile. He helped Sancho of Castile to overcome his brother Alfonso of Leon by a surprise which savored strongly of treachery, but which passed for good strategy in those rough and ready times. After the murder of Sancho by Beido under the walls of Zamora, the Cid passed into the service of his successor, the very Alfonso, whom he had before driven into exile. The king at first welcomed the invincible knights of Castile to his court and married him to his own cousin, but jealous rivals poisoned his mind already filled with the memory of past wrongs against Rodrigo or Ruiz Diaz, as he is styled in the chronicle, and in 1081 the seed was banished from his dominions. The chronicle must tell the story of his farewells and the seed sent for all his friends and his kinsmen and vassals and told them how king don alfonso had banished him from the land and asked of them who would follow him into banishment and who would remain at home then alva fanez who was his cousin german came forward and said seed we will all go with you through desert and through peopled country and never fail you in your service will we spend our mules and horses, our wealth and our garments, and ever while we live, be unto you loyal friends and vessels. And they all confirmed what Alba Fanez had said, and the Cid thanked them for their love, and said that there might come a time in which he should gurgle them. And as he was about to depart, he looked back upon his own home, and when he saw his hall deserted, the household chest unfastened, the doors open, no clocks hanging up, no seat in the porch, no hawks upon the perches, the tears came into his eyes, and he said, My enemies have done this. God be praised for all things. And he turned toward the east and knelt and said, Holy Mary Mother and all saints, Pray to God for me that he may give me strength to destroy all the pagans and to win enough from them to requite my friends therewith and all those who follow and help me. Then he called for Alba Fanez and said unto him, Cousin, the poor have no parts in the wrong which the king hath done us. See now that no wrong be done unto them along our road. And he called for his horse. And then an old woman who was standing at her door said, Go in a lucky minute, and make spoil of whatever you wish. And with this proverb he rode on, saying, Friends, by God's good pleasure we shall return to Castile with great honor and great gain. And as they went out from Bivar, they had a crow on their right hand, and when they came to Burgos, they had a crow on the left. My Cid Ruidiez entered Burgos, having sixty streamers in his company, and men and women went forth to see him, and the men of Burgos and the women of Burgos were at their windows, weeping, so great was their sorrow, and they said with one accord, 
Dios, how good a vessel, if he had but a good lord, must be Scano, and willingly would have each bade him come in, but no one dared to do so. For King Don Alfonso, in his anger, had sent letters to Burgos, saying that no man should give the seat a lodging, and that whosoever disobeyed should lose all that he had, and moreover the eyes in his head. Great sorrow had these Christian folks at this, and they hid themselves when he came near them, because they did not dare speak to him, and my seed went to his posada, and when he came to the door, he found it fastened for fear of the king. And his people called out with a loud voice, but they within made no answer. And the seed rode up to the door, and took his foot out of the stirrup, and gave it a kick, but door did not open with it, for it was well secured. A little girl of nine years old then came out of one of the houses, and said unto him, O seed, the king hath forbidden us to receive you. We dare not open our doors to you, for we should lose our houses, and all that we have, and the eyes in our head. Seed, our evil would not help you, but God and all his saints be with you. And when she had said this, she returned into the house. And when the Cid knew what the king had done, he turned away from the door and rode up to St. Mary's, and there he alighted and knelt down, and prayed with all his heart, and then he mounted again and rode out of the town, and pitched his tent near Alanzon upon the Glera, that is to say, upon the sands. My Cid Ruy Diaz, who in a happy hour first got on his sword, took up his lodging upon the sands, because there was none who would receive him within his door. He had a good company around him, and there he lodged as if he had been among the mountains. The cocks were crowing amain, and the day began to break when the good compiador reached San Pedro. The abbot Don Cisebuto was saying Martins and Doña Jimena, the Cid's wife, and five of her ladies of good lineage were with him praying to God and St. Peter to help my seed. And when he called at the gate, and they knew his voice, Dios, what a joyful man was the abbot Don Cisebuto. Out into the courtyard they went with torches and with tapers, and the abbot gave thanks to God that he now beheld the face of my seed. And the seed told him all that had befallen him, and how he was a banished man, and he gave him fifty marks for himself, and a hundred for Doña Jimena and her children. Abbot, said he, I leave two little girls behind me, whom I commend to your care. Take your care of them, and of my wife, and of her ladies. When this money be gone, if it be not enough, supply them abundantly. For every mark which you expend upon them, I will give you the monastery for and the abbot promised to do this with the right good will. Then Doña Jimena came up, and her daughters with her, each of them born in arms, and she knelt down on both her knees before her husband, weeping bitterly, and she would have kissed his hand, and she said to him, Lo, now you are banished from the land by mischief-making men, and here am I with your daughters, who are little ones and of tender years, and we and you must be parted even in your lifetime. For the love of St. Mary, tell me now what we shall do. And the seed took the children in his arms, and held them to his heart, and wept, for he dearly loved them. Please God and St. Mary, said he, I shall yet live to give these my daughters in marriage with my own hands, and to do you service yet, my honored wife, whom I have ever loved, even as my own soul. A great feast did they make that day on the monastery for the good compiador, and the bells of San Pedro rung merrily. Meantime the tidings had gone through Castile, how my seed was banished from the land, and great was the sorrow of the people. Some left their houses to follow him, others forsook their honorable offices, which they held, and that day a hundred and fifteen knights assembled at the bridge of Alanzon, all in quest of my seed, and there Martin Antolines joined them, and they rode on together to San Pedro's. 
and when he of Viva knew what a good company was coming to join him, he rejoiced in his own strength, and rode out to meet them, and greeted them full courteously, and they kissed his hand, and he said to them, I pray to God that I may one day requite ye well, because ye have forsaken your houses and your heritages for my sake, and I trust that I shall pay ye twofold. Six days of term allotted were now gone, and three only remained. If, after that time, he should be found within king's dominions, neither for gold nor for silver could he then escape. That day they feasted together, and when it was evening, the seed distributed among them all that he had, giving to each man according to what he was, and he told them that they must meet at mass after martins, and depart at that early hour. Before the cock crew they were ready, and the abbot said the mass of Holy Trinity, and when it was done they left the church and went to halls. And my seed embraced Doña Jimena and his daughters, and blessed them, and the parting between them was like separating the nail from the kick flesh, and he wept and continued to look round after them. Then Alba Fanez came up to him and said, Where is your courage, my seed? In a good hour were you born of woman. Think of our road now, these sorrows will yet turn into joy. The Cid offered his services to the Moorish king of Zaragoza, the most powerful of the northern Muslim princes, and they were joyfully accepted. At the head of his own followers, who were the more devoted to him since they lived by the booty he procured them, he made a raid through Aragon, and so rapid was his riding that he harried a vast tract of country in five days and was off before the Christians could sound the alarm. He led the Moors against the Count of Barcelona, won a signal victory, and made the Count his ally. How the Cid and his merry men triumphed in the battlefield, let the chronicle again relate. Pero Bermudez could not bear this, but holding the banner in his hand, he cried, God help you, Cid, Campeador, I shall put your banner in the middle of that main body, and you who are bound to stand by it, I shall see how you will succor it. And he began to prick forward, and the campeador called unto him to stop, as he loved him, but Pero Bermudez replied he would stop for nothing, and away he spurred and carried his banner into the middle of the great body of the Moors. And the Moors fell upon him that they might win the banner, and beset him on all sides, giving him many and great blows to beat him down. Nevertheless, his arms were proof, and they could not pierce them, neither could they beat him down, nor force the banner from him, for he was a right brave man, and a strong and good horseman, and of great heart. And when the Cid saw him thus beset, he called to his people to move on and help him. Then placed they their shield before their hearts, and lowered their lances with the streamers thereon, and bending forward rode on. Three hundred lances were they, each with its pendants, and every man at the first charge slew his moor. Smite them, knights, for the love of charity, cried the compeador. I am Louis Diaz, the seed of Bivar. Many a shield were pierced that day, and many a false corslet was broken, and many a white streamer died with blood, and many a horse left without a rider. The misbelievers called on Mohammed, and the Christians on Santiago, and the noise of the tambours and the trumpets was so great that none could hear his neighbor. And my Cid and his company succored Pero Bermudez, and they rode through the host of Moors, slaying as they went, and they rode back again in like manner. Thirteen hundred did they kill in disguise. If you would know who they were, who were the good men of that day, it behoves me to tell you, for though they are departed, it is not fitting that the names of those who have done well should die, nor would they who have done well themselves, or who hope so to do, think it right. For good men would not be so bound to do well if their good feats should be kept silent. 
There was my seat, the good man in battle, who fought well upon his gilt saddle, and Alva Fanez Minaya, and Martin Antolines the Burgales of Prowess, and Munio Gustios, and Martin Munoz, who held Montemayor, and Alva Alvarez, and Alva Salvadores, and Galin Garcia, the good one of Aragon, and Feliz Munoz, the nephew of the Campeador. Wherever my seed went, the Moors made a path before him, for he smote them down without mercy, and while the battle still continued, the Moors killed the horse of Alva Fanez, and his lance was broken, and he fought bravely with his sword afoot. And my seed, seeing him, came up to an alguazil, who rode upon a good horse, and smote him with his sword under the right arm, so that he cut him through and through, and he gave the horse to Alva Fanez, saying, Mount Minaya, for you are my right hand. The great feat of the Cid's career was the conquest of Valencia. By force of political troubles, he came to occupy the position of protector of the Moorish king of Valencia in the name of the king of Saragossa. His first entry was peaceful and unopposed. Then the Cid went to Valencia, and King Yahya received him full honorably, and made a covenant with him to give him weekly four thousand maravedis of silver, and he on his part was to reduce the castles to his obedience, so that they should pay the same rents unto him as had been paid unto the former king of Valencia, and that Cid should protect him against all men, Moors or Christians, and should have his home in Valencia, and bring all his booty there to be sold, and that he should have his granaries there. This covenant was confirmed in writing so that they were secure on one side and on the other. And my seed sent to all those who held the castles, commanding them to pay their rents to the king of Valencia, as they had done aforetime, and they all obeyed his command, everyone striving to have his love. From the vantage point of Valencia, the seed carried his triumphant arms against the neighboring kingdoms. He warred against Denia and against Hativa, and abode there all the winter, doing great hurt, insomuch that there did not remain a wall standing from Orihuela and Hativa, for he laid everything waste, and all his booty and his prisoners he sold in Valencia. On one of these expeditions, however, he lost his capital for a while. Alfonso, in 1089, has received him back to favor, given him castles and decreed that all the seeds conquest should be his own property. In other words, he recognized the seed as an almost independent prince. Almost immediately, however, the king became again suspicious of his powerful vassal and seized the opportunity of seed's absence in the north to besiege his peculiar possession, the city of Valencia. When the campeador heard this, he was very wroth, and by way of retaliation, carried fire and sword through Alfonso's district of Najera and Calahora, and raised Logroño to the ground, and in the words of the old Latin gesta, with terrible and impious despoilment, he wasted and harried the land, and stripped it bare of its riches and seized them for himself. Alfonso hastily abandoned the siege of Valencia and returned to defend his own country. But the Cid, having effected his purpose, came back another way and found the gates of Valencia closed against him. Then began that memorable siege of nine months, during which the people of Valencia suffered agonies of hunger and thirst, whilst the Cid maintained his remorseless league round the walls. The besieged were reduced to the agonies of starvation, and those who rushed out or were thrust forth as useless burdens by the townspeople were massacred or sold into slavery by the Cid's soldiers. It is even said by the Moorish historians that the Cid had many of them burnt alive. The chronicle pathetically records, now there was no food to be bought in the city, and the people were in the waves of death, Men were seen to drop and die in the streets, thus wrote the poet of the devoted city.
Valencia, Valencia, trouble is come upon thee, and thou art in the hour of death, and if, peradventure, thou shouldst escape, it will be a wonder to all that shall behold thee. But if ever God hath shown mercy to any place, let him be pleased to show mercy unto thee, for thy name was joy, and all the Moors delighted in thee, and took their pleasure in thee. And if it should please God utterly to destroy thee now, it will be for thy great sins, and for the great presumption which thou hast in thy pride. The four cornerstones whereon thou art founded would meet together and lament for thee if they could. Thy strong wall which is founded upon these four stones trembles and is about to fall and hath lost all its strength. Thy lofty and fair towers which are seen from far and rejoice the heart of the people, little by little they are falling. Thy white battlements which glittered afar off have lost their truth with which they shone like the sunbeams. Thy noble river Guadalavia with all the other waters with which thou hast been served so well, have left their channel, and now they run where they should not. Thy watercourses, which were so clear, and of such great profit to so many, for lack of cleansing, are choked with mud. Thy pleasant gardens, which were round about thee, the ravenous wolf hath known at the roots, and the trees can yield thee no fruits. Thy goodly fields, with so many and such fair flowers, wherein thy people were wont to take their pastime, are all dried up. Thy noble harbor, which was so great honor to thee, is deprived of all the nobleness which was wont to come into it for thy sake. The fire had laid waste the lands of which thou were called mistress, and the great smoke thereof reached thee. There is no medicine for thy sore infirmity, and the physicians despair of healing thee. Valencia, Valencia, from a broken heart have I uttered all these things which I have said of thee. And this grief would I keep unto myself, that none should know it, if it were not needful that it should be known to all. At last, in June 1094, Valencia surrendered, and the seat stood once more upon her towers and ramparts. He made hard conditions with the people, many of whom he sent away to the suburbs to make rooms for his Castilians. But if he was harsh and not quite honest in his dealings with the vanquished, his triumph was stained by no wholesale butchery. The people were sometimes ruined, but their lives, except their leaders, were safe. The Cid had now attained the summit of his power. He sent for his wife and daughters from the abbey and established himself permanently as king of Valencia and suzerain of country round about. The king of Aragon besought his alliance. He exacted heavy tribute from his neighbors. His revenue included 120,000 pieces of gold yearly from Valencia, 10,000 from the Lord of Albaracin, 10,000 from the heir of Alpuente, 6,000 from the master of Murviedro, and so forth. He dreamed of reconquering all Andalusia. One Roderick, he said, lost Spain, another shall recover it. When the Almoravides came against him, he put them to rout. The chronicle tells the story. Day is gone and night is come. At cock crow, they all assembled together in the church of San Pedro, and the bishop Don Hieronimo sang mass, and they were shriven and assoiled and houseled. Great was the absolution which the bishop gave them. He who shall die, said he, fighting face forward, I will take his sins, and God shall have his soul. Then said he, a boon, see it, Don Rodrigo, I have sung mass to you this morning, let me have the giving the first wounds in this battle, and the seed granted him this boon in the name of God. Then, being all ready, they went out through the gate, which is called the gate of the snake, for the greatest power of the Moors on that side, leaving good men to guard the gates. Alva Fanez and his company were already gone forth, and had laid their ambush. Four thousand, 
lacking thirty, were they who went out with my seed with a good will to attack fifty thousand. They went through all the narrow places and bad passes, and, leaving the ambush on the left, struck to the right hand, so as to get the moors between them and the town. And the seed put his battles in good array, and bade Pero Bermudez bear his banner. When the moors saw this, they were greatly amazed, and they harnessed themselves in great haste, and came out of their tents. Then Cid bade his banner move on, and the bishop Don Hieronimo pricked forward with his company, and laid on with such a guise, that the host was soon mingled together. Then might you have seen many a horse running about the field with the saddle under his belly, and many a horseman in evil plight upon the ground. Great was the smiting and slaying in short time, but by reason that the Moors were so great a number, they bore hard upon the Christians, and were in the hour of overcoming them. And the seed began to encourage them with a loud voice, shouting God and Santiago. And Alva Fanez at this time issued out from ambush, and fell upon them, on the side which was nearest the sea, and the Moors thought that a great power had arrived to the seed's succor, and they were dismayed and began to fly. And the Cid and his people pursued, punishing them in a bad way. If you should wish to tell you how everyone behaved himself in this battle, it is a thing which could not be done, for all did so well that no man can relate their feats. And the Cid Ruidiez did so well, and made such mortality among the Moors, that the blood ran from his wrist to his elbow. Great pleasure had he in his horse, Bavieca, that day, to find himself so well mounted, and in this pursuit he came up to King Yusuf and smote him three times, but the king escaped from under the sword, for the horse of the seed passed on in his course, and when he turned, the king being on a fleet horse was far off, so that he might not be overtaken, and he got into a castle called Guerra, for so far did the Christians pursue them, smiting and slaying, and giving them no respite, so that hardly fifteen thousand escaped of fifty that they were. But the fortune of war is fickle. The troops of the seed were defeated at last by the invaders, and the campeador died of grief in July 1099. They took his body and embalmed it, and kept vigil by his side, then, in the legend of the poets, they did as the seed had bidden them. They set him upon his good horse Bavieca, and fastened the saddle well, so that he sat erect, with his countenance unchanged, his eyes bright and fair, and his beard flowing down his breast, and his trust sword Tisona in his hand. No one would have known that he was dead, and they led Bavieca out of the city, Pero Bermudez in front with the banner of the seed, and five hundred knights to guard it, and Doña Jimena behind with a company and escort. Slowly they cut a path through the besiegers, and took the road to Castile, leaving the Moors in sore amazement at their strange departure, for they did not know that the seed was dead. But the body of the hero was set in an ivory chair, beside the great altar of San Pedro de Cardena, under a canopy whereon were blazoned the arms of Castile and Leon, Navarre and Aragon, and of the Cid Campeador. Ten years the Cid sat upright beside the altar, his face still noble and comely, when the signs of death at last began to appear, so they buried him before the altar, where Doña Jimena already lay, and they left him in the vault, still upright in the ivory chair, still in his princely robes with the sword Tizona in his hand, still the great campeador whose dinted shield and banner of victory hung desolate over his tomb. End of chapter 11